All right, everybody, we are going to get started. If everyone can find a seat. Thank you all for being here. This is amazing to see all these wonderful faces. Um, my name is Cinnamon Moffat. I'm the research program manager here at Hatfield, which is OSU's um, branch here in Newport. Um, and I will be your host for this evening. Just a reminder, if you haven't been a part of these events, this is a hybrid event. Um, that means we have folks online and we have folks in the room. For folks online, this is a webinar. So that means you do not have control over your camera or your mics, but you're welcome to put any information you you might have any questions for our speaker or any technical issues into the chat. Um, and our wonderful volunteer, Roseanne, um, will help us navigate those and read those out to our speaker at the end. For folks in the room, because this is a hybrid event, it does mean that if you have a question for our speaker at the end, uh, raise your hand or go to the mic stand that's on the side. You will need a mic to ask the question so everybody can hear. So if you can help me with that, that would be great. Um, for folks in the room, uh, there's been a little chatter. Typically, we cannot eat or drink in this room, but tonight we have enough facilities staff to be able to help us clean up after, so we get to eat and drink. It won't always be true, <laughs> but tonight we can. I will tell you there is a cleanup bucket right there. If you spill anything on this beautiful floor, you're all responsible for helping us get it cleaned up. So if you can help us with that, that would be great. But everybody, welcome so much to our Science on Tap this evening. Um, wanted to make a couple of quick announcements. Um, there is information on the check-in table right there for our next big event. Um, if you don't know, we are about to do Marine Science Day, uh, which is April 8th. Uh, that is our big open house. We have about 41 exhibitors, uh, researchers going to show off all the work that they're doing. It's a free event. It's a Saturday from 10 to 4. Really would like to see you come wander, learn lots of things about what's happening here. I also have flyers and bookmarks. So if you would like to help us promote, again, <laughs> my family here, um, feel free to grab a couple of those and spread the word. We like to get lots of folks um, out for that event. We haven't had it on site in three years. So we're very excited about this opportunity. Um, I also wanted to let folks know about our next Science on Tap. Um, let's see. We are going to have Ford um, Evans and Tom Calvanese here to talk to us about a prickly situation, the sea urchins and the kelp forest here in Oregon. Um, so that'll be next month. The announcement should come out very soon. If you don't get announcements about our seminars, you can sign up on that little form there. Um, give me your email and I'll add you to the list if you would like. So you're welcome to do that. But for tonight, why we're actually all here is not to listen to me, um, but to hear our speaker. So I got to put my glasses on and I'm going to do a quick introduction, but we're very excited to have Dr. Josh Stewart here um, to share with us about his work. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about him. Um, so Josh is a quantitative ecologist whose interest spans animal movement, trophic ecology, population dynamics, all with an emphasis on threatened species and ecosystems. He got his master's and his PhD from Scripps. Um, Josh joined as assistant professor in the College of uh, Agriculture Science at Oregon State University. What year, Josh? This year. <laughs> so brand new to us here. I mean, he's a principal investigator at the Marine Mammal Institute's Ocean Ecology Lab here at Hatfield. Josh has a really strong interest in applied science and collaborating with stakeholders and managers and applying his research directly to management with input from those resource users. So we are really excited to learn a little bit more about Josh. So I'm gonna hand it off to Josh. Thanks, Cinnamon. Thanks everybody for being here. It's great to see you all. I'm Josh standing in for Bradley Cooper. Oops. If you're disappointed, I understand. If you came to the wrong talk, I won't be offended if you leave. That's fine. <laughs> All right. So today I'm going to talk about endangered whales and why they aren't recovering as we hoped they would. Um, I'm going to start by putting uh, our sort of modern day situation into context by talking a little bit about where we were just 30 or 40 years ago. Um, so a brief history of whaling. 
I think I need to stand in this blue box for the people online, I'm sorry. Um, we, uh, we started, well, we've been hunting whales, humans have been hunting whales from a subsistence standpoint for human history, throughout human history. But from a commercial standpoint, you know, to make a profit off of whales, uh, we've been doing that for about the last thousand years, which is quite a long time. So commercial whaling started with uh, Basque whalers in Spain and France in the 11th century, and they targeted North Atlantic right whales, which I'm going to talk about a bit, um, starting just from shore in that uh, Basque region, but eventually expanding all throughout the North Atlantic uh, into the South Atlantic as well. And they pretty much had a monopoly on commercial whaling for 500 years or so. Uh, in the 1700s in Nantucket, the Nantucket whaling community also kind of caught on, started hunting North Atlantic right whales, um, and eventually moved on to sperm whales. So that's where, you know, Moby Dick comes from and Herman Melville. Um, and in the 1700s or so with the, the booming industrial revolution, there was a huge surge in demand for whale oil as a lubricant for uh, industrial machinery. And so whalers started going further afield, hunting sperm whales, especially which had the highest quality whale oil. Um, and global whaling kind of took off at that point. <clears throat> Uh, moving forward to the 18 and 1900s, we kind of made this transition from sailing ships that were limited in speed and range uh, to these sort of major technological advances where we had diesel powered ships, first steamships, and then combustion engine powered ships. Uh, through the world wars, we had these uh, technological advances and military machinery, which led to these uh, explosive tipped harpoons. Um, and that really led to a huge increase in the number of species that we could hunt. We could suddenly hunt species that were uh, earlier too fast for us to hunt down, like blue and fin whales. Uh, we could expand our whaling range to all over the world, down to the poles. Um, and we also developed these factory processing ships so we could hunt and process whales without needing to go back to land. And this series of technological advances led to a huge boom in whaling captures in the 1900s. And it's just really an astonishing number. So we saw this huge peak in the early 1900s. We were literally catching, if you look at this axis, hundreds of thousands of whales per year in some cases, uh, which is really just an astonishing number. Um, so in about 100 years, only in the 19th, 1900s, the 20th century, humans captured about 3 million whales, and that's probably an underestimate. That is, as far as we know, the largest cull of any animal in human history. And the consequences for these populations were extreme. Some of these graphs are hard to read because these populations plummet so quickly in response to commercial whaling. Oh, let me turn on the laser pointer. Thanks for the tip, Cinnamon. Right, so these declines here, just in a matter of years or decades, in some cases, we're literally hunting whales to the brink of extinction. And this is in the 1960s or so, right? So this is not a, a far distant historical event. This is in some of our lifetimes. Uh, and for these whales, it's in some cases just a few generations. All right. Um, so there were definitely attempts by the international community, the International Whaling uh, Commission, to limit harvest of these species as they were uh, being decimated. But uh, what really ended commercial whaling was what we call commercial extinction. So we hunted so many of these whales that it was no longer profitable for us to continue doing so. And then we all got together and said, hey, we should probably stop that. And lo and behold, it worked. Um, so uh, just that historical context, you know, it's only in the last 40 or so years that we've had robust international protections uh, to prevent the harvest of these species. And the amazing thing, in my opinion, is that there have been so many remarkable recoveries. So I had this uh, plot for humpback whales on the last slide here. And, you know, they were in many parts of the global ocean, they were hunted to near extinction, and they are in some cases recovering already within 40 years or so uh, to levels potentially before whaling. 
Um, gray whales are another great example of this right off our coast here. They've made stunning recoveries and they're sort of held up as these examples of what successful conservation can look like when we implement, implement effective management strategies. Um, so I don't wanna you know, overstate the successes of these conservation actions and recoveries of whales, but in many cases, they really are the poster child for effective management. Uh, but that's not universally true. There are many species that are not recovering well. Uh, there are even species that despite our best efforts, or in some cases, uh, kind of mediocre efforts, are not recovering and are even in decline despite us not actively hunting them anymore. Um, and these species, these kind of laggards, the ones that are struggling despite our efforts are the ones that really interest me from a research perspective. Uh, so today I'm gonna to talk about my work with some of these endangered populations of whales. Uh, and I hope to provide some insights about how we as humans continue to impact these populations despite removing these impacts of direct hunts uh, and how that's preventing their recoveries and hopefully what we can do to change that in the future. <clears throat> so I'm gonna tap a few little vignettes of different projects that I've worked on throughout the years. Uh, the first one I like to call the curious case of the tiny right whales. So right whales, uh, as I mentioned, are one of the earliest species to be hunted by humans commercially. Um, Basque hunters essentially uh, eliminated their populations in the Eastern Atlantic and then followed them up into the Northwest Atlantic off Massachusetts uh, and Canada. Um, they've been hunted for over a thousand years. They were hunted to commercial extinction. species to receive any kind of international protection by the League of Nations, which was the precursor to the UN in 1935. Um, there are a few different species or populations of right whales. There are the North Pacific right whales, which actually are probably the smallest population of whales in the world. They were uh, hunted to the point where they really have not recovered and may not have the capacity to recover. They're only 30 or 40 of those um, left. It's really exciting when anybody sees them on a survey. Um, Southern right whales, in contrast, are uh, considered you know, least concerned. So their populations are largely increasing. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, but they've made these really remarkable recoveries, right? Um, so this red line here is Southern right whale population trends. It's many different populations in the Southern hemisphere, but around the last 100 years showing this really dramatic recovery. They're not back to where they were before we started hunting them, but they are doing quite well and they're on an upward trend in most cases. And I've pulled up these North Atlantic right whales and you're probably wondering where the heck are they? And they're this tiny blue line that you probably didn't even notice here because in contrast to uh, Southern right whales, North Atlantic right whales have been struggling in their recovery. Um, so they were making a slow but steady recovery from the 1980s onwards, but for the last 10 years, they have essentially been in free fall. So they have been declining quickly. Uh, there are around 350 of them left, and so far there's no sign of recovery. Um, so what makes these North Atlantic right whales so vulnerable to human impacts? Well, ironically, it's many of the same characteristics that made them um, an appealing target for whalers that also makes them vulnerable to modern human impacts. Um, so that includes this coastal distribution. They like to hang out very close to the coast, uh, which makes them vulnerable to ship strikes. So this is a big modern human impact. Uh, whales get hit by large vessels and are either uh, severely injured or in many cases, they're just outright killed by vessel strikes. Uh, and we also have entanglements. So uh, in the Northeast US, Northwest Atlantic, um, entanglement in uh, uh, vertical trap buoys. So often used for lobster fisheries, although there are other fisheries as well over there that entangle these whales, um, lead to these deadly entanglements. And so these have been on the rise for the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, our fishing intensity has been increasing significantly um, as lobster populations recover and boom in many of these areas. We also have 
huge increases in vessel traffic. This is a really busy part of the ocean. We've got shipping vessels coming into Boston Harbor and all along the east coast of the US, lots of recreational vessels all up and down the east coast. Uh, and that's led to some increases in vessel strikes, but also potentially a lot of disruptions from vessel noise. And then this North uh, Atlantic ecosystem is one of the most rapidly warming ecosystems on the planet. And we think that may be having impacts to their uh, prey, their zooplankton prey, um, but that's less of a clear pattern than some of these other ones, such as entanglements. So we know that these entanglements and ship strikes are just killing North Atlantic right whales outright, um, but not every whale that gets entangled dies. So there are many of these uh, disentanglement teams, we were just talking about those, uh, Craig and Greg, um, where uh, when an, an entangled whale is reported, a team will go out and try and disentangle them, uh, cutting off the trailing gear. But many of these whales remain entangled for months or in some cases up to a year. And uh, the work I've been doing uh, over the past few years has looked into what is the effect of these entanglements. So even if one of these whales doesn't die, what kind of impact does a long-term entanglement like that have on this whale? And I wanna acknowledge my collaborators here. Um, I've been really privileged to work on a number of data sets uh, that have been collected since before I was born. Um, this is one of them. So they've been collecting data since the early 1980s. Uh, and Amy Knowlton and Philip Hamilton have been collecting incredible sightings data on uh, individual whales, how often they're entangled, uh, how often they give birth. <clears throat> and Michael Moore has been uh, collecting information on the impacts of those entanglements on North Atlantic right whales. Um, I got involved in this project during my time at the NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center, which has this incredible uh, photogrammetry history where They've, they started by flying planes over whales and using these modified military reconnaissance film cameras to uh, take photos. <clears throat> and they had to sort through all of these slide, uh, slide reels and measure whales manually. So I'm benefiting from all the hours and hours of manual work that uh, Morgan and Wayne and others like him have done. Uh, and then more recently, our, uh, our photogrammetry technology has switched to uh, drone-based photogrammetry, which is logistically a heck of a lot easier. And that's been pioneered by uh, John Durbin and Holly Fernback, who are two very close collaborators of mine. And John is also a, a professor here at MMI. Um, so <clears throat> this photogrammetry data gives us incredible information about the health of individual whales. Uh, so in short, a skinny whale is an unhappy whale and a fat whale is a happy whale. And we know from comparing the condition of these whales, the North Atlantic right whales with their Southern counterparts, that these North Atlantic right whales in blue are in very poor condition compared to their Southern counterparts. So all of these impacts, entanglements, ship traffic are probably having an overall impact on their health. We can also use these photogrammetry data to look at the growth rates of individual whales. So what we're looking at here, because of this incredible data set that has been monitoring these whales since the 1980s, we know the exact age of many of these whales because they were tracked since they were born. And then we also have measurements of them. So we can see these really rapid early growth rates, uh, after which point when they're big enough to avoid predators and survive, they kind of stop growing quite as fast. Uh, and so this is where my story with North Atlantic right whales kind of, st kind of starts. Uh, I was comparing these growth rates of whales from um, those early days with film cameras and fixed wing aircraft to the more recent data sets that included these drone measurements. And, you know, these older whales, they just kind of uh, continue along 20 years later, which is sort of the gap in when these two data sets were collected. Uh, but suddenly there are all of these small whales that are much, much smaller than we expect based on their age. And if we kind of flip between these two, you can really see suddenly this shift in the age structure and the size structure where you suddenly have way more of these individual whales that are much smaller than we would expect them to be based on their age. Uh, so we started thinking about, you know, what could be an explanation for this? Is it all these entanglements that they're experiencing? 
Uh, maybe if their mom was entangled, that could have an impact on their growth. Uh, lactation is one of the most energetically costly periods of a mammal's life. So you're offloading huge amounts of energy to your nursing calf. And so if you have lots of babies, maybe that restricts your growth as well. So we were interested in maybe there are some natural explanations for this as well. Um, I'm a nerd. I, I really like to build statistical models. It's a big part of what I do. <clears throat> so I have lots of fun plots. This, this really gets me going, probably not as much for you guys. Um, but so what we find is indeed entanglement and whether mom was entangled has a negative impact on individual growth. Not so much how many uh, calves you've had before your sort of growth period ends, but then despite all of these, uh, these effects that we could estimate from entanglement, we still found this persistent effect that was just based on what year you were born in. So if you were born more recently, a, a whale born in 2019, we estimated would end up about a meter shorter than a whale born in 1980. Huge impacts. And so we hypothesized, you know, what might be causing this? Could it be this increasing rate of entanglements? Um, we have incredible entanglement histories for many of these whales, but we don't see every entanglement. There are lots that go undetected where they can free themselves uh, before an entanglement team maybe gets to them. So we think that might be a result of these increasing entanglements. It could also be disruption on their feeding grounds from vessels. Uh, it's really hard for us to say, but it's probably one of these human impacts. And so what we see when we construct these growth curves for different impacted uh, whales, that the entire growth trajectory just shifts downwards. So this up here in gray is a, a normal whale. So a whale that's never entangled and was born in 1980. Uh, this orange is a whale that was born in 2019, what we expect their growth trajectory to be. And then these are uh, either they are entangled or their mom is entangled, which is about the same effect. And then, of course, many of these tiny whales had some combination of those different impacts. And it's all well and good looking at these growth curves, <clears throat> but what does this actually look like for individual whales? So this is a handful of whales that have been measured over the years. And from those growth curves, we can calculate expectations. What would we expect a whale of this age uh, to look like in terms of length? And we see that, you know, while well, these whales born in earlier years are about as long as we expect, which is this outline. Some of these whales born more recently are smaller than calves, right? So this is a five-year-old whale, an 11-year-old whale, about the same size as what we expect a one-year-old calf to be. So these are huge individual impacts, right? And one of the things that we're concerned about is what might the consequences of being one of these stunted whales be? Right, We know that obviously it's great that they didn't uh, die from an entanglement or they didn't die from a ship strike, but what does the rest of their life look like when they're so much shorter than we uh, would anticipate normally? So it might take them longer to reach reproductive age. Uh, there might be longer intervals between calving because they take longer to recover from these really energy intensive pregnancies and lactation periods. Uh, they, by being smaller, might produce smaller and skinnier calves, which have lower survival probabilities. Um, and then if you are a small whale, you might have a higher probability of an entanglement becoming uh, deadly as well. And especially these impacts on the reproductive side of things are really concerning because when we look at uh, how survival probability for this population has changed over time, there have definitely been you know, decreases in survival probability and pretty big impacts in response to many of these increasing human threats, but it's nothing compared to this huge decline in calving probability. And when we think about recovering these populations, there are really two levers that we need to be thinking about. There's obviously reducing mortalities, but we also need those reproductive rates to be at reasonable levels or else they're not gonna recover. So these are the two levers that we think about and we really see that calving probability has suffered the most over the last few decades. Oh, that didn't reproduce well. Um, so we tested all of these. Again, we went back to these incredible sighting histories for all of these North Atlantic right whales. And we can look at how many calves each of these whales has produced over its entire lifetime. Um, so we found that there was not really a, a relationship between their length and the age that they first reproduced. 
but we definitely saw significant impacts on length and how many calves they, they produce per reproductive year. So we scale it for how many years they've had to reproduce. And the driver of that seems to be longer birth intervals. So the larger a whale is, the shorter the interval between pregnancies and successful calving events. And so to kind of tie all this together, what we're finding is that yes, indeed, uh, vessel strikes and entanglements are leading to increased mortality rates for this population, which are super concerning. But those same impacts are also influencing reproductive rates by constraining the growth of these whales, reducing their body condition, and all of that adds up to lower reproductive rates over their lifetime, right? So we're, uh, we know that that other lever, that reproduction lever can also be impacted by these entanglements. And what that means is that from a management perspective, we certainly should be trying to prevent deaths, but we also need to prevent these sublethal injuries. So we can't say, hey, if we stop any of these whales from dying, that's enough. Uh, because we know now that these also have major impacts on their reproductive rates and therefore their recovery capacity. We also know that as we have an expanding human footprint in the oceans through especially fishing pressure, that these large whale entanglements are increasing. This is off the U.S. West Coast, uh, especially when we have climate impacts that change where we expect to see these large whales. We often have interactions with fisheries that we weren't expecting. Uh, and we've been uh, recently seeing increasing entanglements uh, in many parts of the world, but especially here off the West Coast. And that means that uh, many of these populations are probably impacted also by these sublethal uh, threats, you know, impacts to reproduction from these entanglements that are really hard to detect. And we, we find that we can only detect them in these really well-studied populations. Um, so just to tie this back to our coast here, um, humpbacks are one of the species that have made these exceptional recoveries, right? They're everywhere. Their populations are doing great. Many people aren't worried about them anymore, Kate, um, because they have just made such stupendous recoveries. However, there are some exceptions to that. And two of them are these populations that uh, winter in Mexico and Central America and summer, they feed right off our coast here in Oregon, Washington, and California. And they also are exposed to much more fishing effort, uh, potential entanglements with fishing gear, both on the feeding grounds here, uh, which one of our colleagues, Lee Torres, is looking at, and on their breeding grounds in Mexico and Central America, which is a project that Daniel Palacios and I have recently started. Um, so it's probably no surprise that these whales that live in these you know, urbanized environments that spend a lot of time close to human activity are the ones that are struggling to recover. How am I doing on time? Whoa, 6.30 already. I'm talking too much. All right, let's talk about Southern resident killer whales for a bit. Uh, we're gonna shift gears, move back to the Pacific Northwest. So probably many of you are familiar with Southern residents. Uh, these are the fish eating killer whales that live in the Pacific Northwest in contrast to the mammal eating killer whales that we more frequently see off our coast here. Um, Southern residents uh, back in the 50s and 60s were a nuisance, right? They were competing with fishermen for salmon. So fishermen would shoot them, harass them, chase them. Um, they were also the main target for the aquarium trade. So all of the captive orcas were fish eating killer whales because they didn't want to mess around with the mammal eating killer whales. That didn't seem like a good idea. Um, and so that had major impacts, especially on the Southern resident population. Um, they had been recovering from these impacts through the 90s, but since around 1995, the population also has been in decline. And we only have 73 of these whales left. So it's a super, super small population, very endangered. Um, there are a few different theories on what's causing this population decline. Uh, one is their distribution in the Salish Sea, which is a heavily polluted area. There are lots of persistent organic pollutants, which might affect their reproductive success uh, and survival probability. Um, vessel traffic, again, right? This is a recurring issue, uh, potentially through vessel strikes, but mainly through disruption of their feeding behavior, right? So these are echolocators, and if there's a lot of noise in the water, it becomes harder for them to effectively target prey. And this third one, prey limitation, 
uh, is the one I'm going to focus on today. Um, we are affecting salmon populations throughout the Pacific Northwest, especially uh, largely through climate change, habitat degradation. Um, salmon populations are suffering and the animals that eat them also are suffering. Uh, and so we think that prey limitation is a major impact on southern resident killer whales. And not only that, but when uh, prey populations are in low supply, we also think that increases the effects of things like vessel traffic. Um, if there's not a lot of salmon around, it makes it even more important that they're being disrupted by vessel traffic. Uh, and they start to metabolize those pollutants in their blubber more um, uh, in, in greater quantity when they are uh, when they're skinny, right? Um, so this work that I'm going to talk about also relies on aerial photogrammetry data sets collected by John and Holly. Um, this one, a little different, they started collecting when I was in high school. So um, I've got an, I'm having a midlife crisis or something, and I, I need the, I need to emphasize how young I am, I think. Uh, so this aerial photogrammetry data gives us incredible, beautiful photos but it also gives us this really great quantitative data on body condition. So you can see that these three whales are in very different condition. This one is super skinny um, and somewhere in the middle. And then this is a, a chunk over here. Um, and we can quantify their condition using what we call an eye patch ratio. And uh, again, I could talk about all the statistics that would be really exciting for me, but less exciting for you. So I won't do that to you. Um, but we can take these eye patch ratios, we can break them up into uh, condition classes. So we've got really skinny whales in this condition class one, and these middle of the road whales in two and three, and so forth. And the first thing we can do straight off the bat is we can say, what's the mortality probability of whales in these different conditions? So really skinny whales, we find, have a, a double or triple probability of dying within a year than these more robust whales. It's a very gentle way of putting it. I like that. The robust whales do better. Um, so this is really important because this underlies uh, dynamic management strategies where we can say which of these whales are at risk. And before any whales die, can we say overall, you know, what is the sort of condition of this population? And when you only have 73 whales, it's really important that we take action before any whale dies. So this information has been really important for underpinning um, these dynamic management strategies that John and Holly are working on with the um, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and the NOAA West Coast Regional Office, where they can identify animals of concern and make management actions before you end up with a dead whale. So that's been a really important outcome of this work. Uh, but we can also look at changes in condition. We can say, hey, if this whale declines, or if it increases in condition, can we tie that to specific changes in, uh, in prey populations? And this is really important because despite the amount of effort we've spent studying these whales, we don't actually know which of these salmon populations are the most important for them, right? And uh, these body condition data give us this really high resolution insight into changes in individual and population health that we don't otherwise get from changes in mortality rates and birth rates, which are much, much more delayed. Um, so we can compare changes in condition to all of these different stocks. And one of the really important findings that we had, cinnamon, my slides aren't reproducing, um, is that Fraser River Chinook salmon, so this is uh, the Fraser River runs through Vancouver, Canada, uh, appears to have the strongest influence on um, southern resident body condition. So when you have more salmon, you've got healthier whales, whales that are more likely to increase their condition. And when you have fewer salmon, uh, you have whales that are much more likely to get skinny. And we know when they get skinny, they've got a higher probability of dying. Um, so <clears throat> this is important because it allows us to pin, pinpoint a few Chinook salmon stocks that can be targeted for management action. Uh, because you know there are millions of Chinook salmon on the on the Pacific coast here. It's really hard for us to say, hey, we're just going to universally increase salmon. They have a lot of their own threats. So if we want to target management action to support the southern resident population, 
Uh, it's much more effective if we can say which of their prey stocks are most important for us to target these actions. Um, we're also seeing, uh, there should be a little green box here. So one of the reasons that Southern residents are this icon of the Pacific Northwest is because they spend a lot of time feeding in the San Juan Islands where they're really visible to the public. And the reason they do that is because in the summer months, salmon, especially to the Fraser River, return through the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And then the Southern residents get to just kind of hang out here and munch on salmon as they navigate the, the maze of the San Juan Islands. So it's a really effective place for them to hang out and target salmon. Um, and this Fraser River population has been declining over the last two decades. And so this is sort of the general trend in Chinook returns to the Fraser River. And you can see a lot of that, this is from 2004 versus 2020, uh, has been these spring returns just totally bottoming out. <clears throat> And what we've found is that over that same time period, uh, Southern resident occupancy in those San Juan Islands and that core habitat that they spend their summers in has declined about 85%, huge declines. And those are related to how much salmon is returning, right? So when there's less salmon, they spend less time in the San Juan Islands. Um, and they have to go, we think, further afield to search for prey sources. And uh, we're concerned about that because a lot of the management actions that have been put in place are focused on this summer feeding grounds, right? And, and when they leave those areas, which they have been doing the last few years, uh, they're exposed to all kinds of other human impacts and in areas where they're much less regulated, like ship traffic off this uh, in the Strait of Juan de Fuca coming into Seattle and Vancouver is huge. Um, so uh, Kate, Stafford and I, with our colleagues at NOAA here, um, are starting a project to study the distribution of Southern resident killer whales out here on the coast of Washington uh, to hopefully help answer some of these questions about what salmon stocks are they targeting as the uh, Chinook returning to the Fraser River declines, and what does that mean for their exposure to some of these other harmful human impacts? Stay tuned for more on that in five to 10 years. <clears throat> All right, so uh, I'm going to switch gears a little to finish up here. This is the last thing. Um, you're all happy because you have beer inside, so I won't mind too much about going five minutes over. <clears throat> so um, we've talked about how you know modern human impacts like ship traffic, vessel strikes, entanglements in fishing gear uh, have prevented the recovery of some of these impacted, endangered whale populations. But I think it's also important to ask the question, what does recovery actually look like? What should we be anticipating? What, what do we hope to see? Um, and to answer that question, I'm going to turn to one of our other local residents here, the gray whale, uh, which migrates past the coast of Oregon on its way up to the Arctic every year. And gray whales, gray whales are considered this iconic example <clears throat> of successful conservation. So um, they were hunted down to just a few thousand individuals, and uh, they have recovered up to upwards of 20,000 whales. They were delisted from the Endangered Species Act in 1994 because they were such a, uh, a recovery success. And we love dis delisting things from the ESA. When that happens, we're really excited because it means we succeeded, right? <clears throat> we did a good job. They're all good. Nothing to worry about, folks. And then, we started having these unusual mortality events. Um, so you were probably familiar with these or you may or may not be, but uh, we started seeing these uh, increases in strandings of gray whales on the US West Coast uh, starting in 2019. And now there have been upwards of 600 gray whales that have washed up in the last few years. And I put unusual in quotes because the same thing also happened in uh, 1999 and 2000. So this is the second time um, since I was in high school or something um, that, <laughs> that gray whales have uh, stranded in these huge numbers on the West Coast. Uh, so a little refresher, gray whales migrate from their breeding grounds on uh, the Baja California Peninsula up to the Arctic to feed every summer. And we've had these incredible 
um, time series, these monitoring stations that have been led by NOAA, the National Marine Fisheries Service, um, since my parents were in high school. Okay, so 19... 1967, <laughs> 1967 was when they started counting gray whales in California. Um, and uh, they also, we have counts of calves, how many, uh, how many calves are swimming by on the northbound migration with their moms. Uh, we also have incredible body condition data and then the strandings data, of course, which uh, was used to identify these unusual mortality events. And so the picture becomes uh, much less clear when you start to look at these abundance trends. So these are from those counts on the California coast, which everything's looking great up until my birth year in 1988. And then what happens? Chaos, absolute chaos, right? We see these huge declines. So this is also the irony is this is right around when we delisted them from the ESA, right? And then boom they declined by around 25% of the population in just two years. And we see two more of these. Uh, this is the 99-2000, and this is our current trajectory here. And we also have this information at the <clears throat> birth rate level, body condition level. So we see huge swings in birth rates. These are these big spikes in mortalities. This is like what I read about in my textbook, my biology textbook for like lemmings or something, right? This is not what we expect from a long lived species that, you know, takes 20 years to mature and only gives birth to one calf per year. Uh, this, is, this is wild. I mean, I really think this is crazy. These are not the kinds of fluctuations that we expect um, for these long lived marine mammals. Um, so we can put all this, this information together and we can recover information on the carrying capacity <clears throat> of the population, which drives all of those different birth rates, death rates, body condition. Uh, and we see, again, these major fluctuations that correspond with all of that. And then we start asking questions about what might be driving carrying capacity. And we find that uh, conditions in the Arctic where they're feeding every year have a really, really strong correlation with these major fluctuations. So gray whales, the reason they don't spend the whole year in the Arctic is because they need to wait for the ice to break up so that they can physically access their foraging grounds. Um, and so we find that the number of days that they can access their foraging grounds is one of the major drivers of carrying capacity. And the other is the biomass of their prey, which are these tiny, tiny little tube building amphipods, which burrow into the sediment and build these little tubes. Uh, gray whales are the only cetacean, the only large baleen whale that specializes on uh, as a bottom feeder. So they actually go down to the seafloor and they feed on the mud plumes, sucking up these little amphipods. And we find that uh, on the left here, this is the number of days that they can access their feeding grounds in the Arctic. And when we have these UMEs, these major mortality events, which are these arrows, we see these major declines in the number of days that they can access those feeding grounds. And that's been trending upwards. They have typically had more access as a result of climate change, but the last few years, there's just been a huge decline in how many days they get to feed. And then again, over here on the right, we have uh, that prey biomass. So how much food they have. So it's a combination between when they can access and how much food they get when they actually reach those feeding grounds. And when those two things align, when you've got low access and low prey biomass, that's when we get those major, major mortality events, which is we're in the midst of one right now. And I also just called out this other one, which is sort of the outlier where we had low prey biomass, but kind of average access to the feeding grounds. And here are those same arrows again. So we see these depressed birth rates, uh, at each of those, we see these major mortality events. And then this red one, we see kind of a, a little baby baby mortality event. Instead of a UME, we see a baby, a mini ME. Um, so the other thing that we've found recently, this is all new stuff. That's why I'm, I'm so jazzed about it. Um, we see that the quality of their prey has been declining over the last 50 years as well. So this is crustacean abundance, those little amphipods. 
um, on the x-axis and then biomass on the y-axis per sample. So essentially what this is showing is this huge decline in the quality of their prey where for the same number of crustaceans, you get way lower biomass in recent years. Um, so suspiciously, abundance has not really changed much. In some cases, you might even see an upward trend, which has really obscured this picture for us uh, for the last few years. The abundance of their prey has not declined, but the quality of their prey, which is this middle panel, has really just bottomed out here. And that's led to these major fluctuations, all of which line up with those major mortality events or depressions uh, in birth rates, which is driven by this carrying capacity. Um, so I find this really fascinating because this is uh, really one of the first glimpses that we're getting into what natural whale population dynamics should look like. Whale populations have been so small compared to the, his the historical abundances before whaling um, that they probably aren't really regulated by the environment in the way that they once were. So food constraint probably has not been a major problem for these populations because they are so low below uh, what the environment can support. Um, so as they recover and they reach pre-whaling levels like gray whales probably have, we probably need to be prepared to uh, encounter more dramatic variability than we're used to and perhaps than we're comfortable with. Um, and that's especially true with these increasing effects of climate change that are especially profound in this, these polar regions that many of the large whales depend on. Okay, so I, I don't want to end on a depressing note. <clears throat> um, everybody's like, wow, I came for a beer in Wales and this guy just took a dump on my evening. I'm so sorry. Andy's not Bradley Cooper. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, so disappointing. Um, so despite all of these, you know, these challenging, uh, these challenges for these whale populations, I actually find uh, a lot of this to be really encouraging, especially the gray whale story. Um, because what it shows us is that when we remove these direct threats, when we remove these uh, you know, direct hunting, and then especially these modern impacts like ship strikes and entanglements, um, these species have an incredible capacity to recover really, really quickly. I mean, when you think about these populations have recovered in the last 40 years, that's like a couple generations for them, that they have gone from borderline you know, near extinction to making these really dramatic recoveries. Um, so I find that to be really optimistic, uh, really encouraging, because it shows us that if we can identify what these impacts are, um, if we can make better management plans to remove and reduce and mitigate those impacts, we know that these species can recover. Um, and same goes for gray whales. After every one of these major declines, so far, they have made, again, these incredible recoveries back up to close to these sort of average high abundances. Um, and I certainly hope that's going to be the case. And I'm optimistic that that's going to be the case for this most recent one. Um, so that's my happy take on all this. And with that, I will say thanks so much for your attention. I'm only five minutes late, and I will take any questions that you have. All right, everybody, I have a funny feeling we'll get some questions here. Uh, we're going to take turns between those folks online and the folks in the room. And we're actually going to start with online. Do we have any questions? Uh, yes, we have one. Uh, do you have a source that details how many right whale in... Oof. Is that me? Who did that? <laughs> okay, let's try this again. Uh, do you have a source that details how many right whale entanglements are happening each year and the resulting impact each year over the last couple of decades? Boat strike seems to be the biggest issue, but hard to get any details on, on entanglement in the, out, in the outcomes. Um. Am I? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, good question. So the North, the uh, New England Aquarium releases a report card every year that details um, 
the number of entanglement mortalities and ship strike mortalities, as well as an abundance estimate that they produce alongside NOAA. So I would just Google 2022 North Atlantic right whale post, uh, postcard, and you will definitely be able to find that info. Questions in the room, raise your hand. Thanks. Great talk, Josh. Really wide ranging and just phenomenal amount of information. Um, I did see that you, I mean, you talked about the previous question was about entanglements and, you know, um, getting the information. And certainly for right whales, where there is a tremendous amount, I mean, you've got a very small population. Mm -hmm. You've got individuals that are well known. You have a huge amount of aerial survey work that is going into getting a handle on that. You also showed a, a, a graph for the West Coast. And as you did mention, you know, the issue is that many wangle, uh, entanglements are not observed. And basically, the graph that you showed is those that are confirmed. The problem with those graphs, which are shown over and over and over again, is that although it's the best statistic that we have, it's a very poor one because there is no denominator in there to standardize it. And so it it, it just... It bothers me every time I see it, having done entanglement work and mm. having, you know, gotten the reports and heard, you know, and and seen entangled whales um, and, and tried to, you know, disentangle them. So it's just a comment there. Um, and also on the West Coast, you know, how much data are we going to need to get a handle on the effects, those non-lethal effects on those populations of humpbacks and blue mm. whales that are mm -hmm. on our coast? Yeah. A lot of good questions there, Greg. Um, so bear with me for 15 minutes here. Um, no, so that those are all really great points. Um, where do I begin? So I guess the first one is that we, I think there's this conception that you know, we know so much about whales. Yeah, you know, there's so much money to study them. We know it all. We know what's going on with them. You know, let's not worry about it. The shark people think that. Um, <laughs> so, and it's, I think it's remarkable how, how many huge knowledge gaps there are despite that, right? And so, as you say, it's only these populations where we literally see half of the whales every year, or for Southern residents, we have a census of them every year that we can actually detect these impacts, absolutely. And so I think that we have to draw from these populations where we do have a lot of data, we can actually ask questions about what are the sublethal effects, and there's definitely some degree of extrapolation. And I would say that, I mean, there's no reason I think a humpback would be any different, you know, in terms of what the sublethal impacts are um, versus a right whale. And to your other point, so from our gray whale model, we can see from all these different data sources, what is the total mortality for the population? And then we can look at how many actually end up as strandings on the coast here. And the number is about 5%. So absolutely. And that's just whales that actually wash up dead, not whales that, you know, have a, a, an entanglement that's non-lethal or whatever. So these numbers are a tiny fraction of what's actually happening out there. They're close. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I, I'm going to aggressively agree with you all day. <laughs> absolutely. Thanks. All right. We're yeah, going to go to a question point. online. Uh, what strategies are being tried to reduce entanglements? And someone else said uh, they understand that there is an effort to use time biodegradable rope on lobster and crab pots. Yeah. Um, the So <laughs> the lobster industry, and, you know, these are huge economic engines for the Northeast. And I think everybody's gut reaction is, oh, well, if you're killing whales, you should quit fishing, right? And that's often proposed. 
I think the most encouraging solution in my view um, that uh, kind of balances both, you know, the impacts to the whales and also, you know, real economic impacts to communities are ropeless fishing technologies. So we use this when we put equipment in the ocean as scientists, uh, we have these acoustic releases that will, you know, it puts a, an instrument on the seafloor and then we can ping it and a buoy comes up and that allows us to, you know, recover it with a rope without a rope always constantly in the water uh, that a whale could swim into and so forth. And uh, these ropeless technologies are, there are attempts to implement those for uh, lobster and, and bottom fisheries as well, which would essentially remove these vertical lines from the water column while hopefully not impacting, you know, these lucrative fishing industries at the same time. So I think that's the most encouraging is ropeless fishing gear. Great questions in the room. Hang on just a second. I got to run up there. All right, good talk. Um, half glass empty. So um, when I interviewed Wallace J. Nichols, the turtle guy, uh -huh. pioneers, he's kind of famous. Um, every day he goes out, it's depressing because he knows that they're declining. There's not, not much you can do with, with turtles. Mm -hmm. um, so for the younger people, what gives you um, a lack of hope for 30 years down the road? A lack of hope? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, I've heard talks about, you know, plastics in the prey and the animals and the synergistic effects of, of all of that, the epigenetics of, of those, those things that are increasing. So you can stop the lobster fisheries, which we did basically, what, last month, but we have all these other factors that are affecting the uh, mortality of, of whales. So what do you see 30 years from now? be honest. Woof. Rough question. Um, well, I'll, I'll emphasize again, what gives me hope is this, which is that we know, we know it can be done because it has happened for many species. And we know that when we remove those impacts, um, you know, great things can happen. Recoveries can happen. What makes me pessimistic is the same as climate change. You know, we all are seeing these impacts and yet we're doing very little about it. So, just, you know, we need to know what the impact is in order to address it, but that doesn't mean that we are going to address it. So what makes me most pessimistic is the fact that, crap, we kind of know what the problem is for a lot of these species, and yet there's just not the political will to do anything about it. So for the most endangered species like North Atlantic right whales, it's not really a big question of what do we need to do? It's just whether or not we're going to do it. And yeah, that would be what makes me the most pessimistic. But hopefully we do better. All right, question online. <laughs> how, <laughs> how correlated are the number of days free of ice in amphipod biomass? How correlated are they? Yeah, so, uh, so warming in the Arctic is, you know, very directly affecting sea ice cover. That's, you know, the most direct one. Um, which is that first variable that influences, you know, whether they can access their feeding grounds. Um, at the same time, climate change is also likely influencing those benthic amphipod abundances. So you get, as sea ice melts, you get more warm water moving in, which uh, changes the sediment structure and changes the species distribution of these different amphipods. Um, so that, that decline in prey quality is probably largely climate driven and the sea ice decreases are also largely climate driven. That said, on the foraging grounds themselves, there's not a really strong correlation between the sea ice in a given year and the amphipod abundance in a given year. Um, so they're not just you know conflated in our analyses, although probably the same underlying drivers are affecting both of them. Okay, I'm noticing that we're at time. So I wanted to hand this back to you and just say anything else you wanna wrap up with, with us? Um, no, thanks so much for being here and drinking a beer with me and talking about whales. That was fun. All right, everybody. <laughs>
Thank you all for being here. Thanks for those folks online. I hope we see you next month um, and at Marine Science Day on April 8th. Thanks, everybody. For those that had cups and glasses and food in the room, if you could take that back out with you, that would be awesome. For folks online, we're going to end the presentation now. Thanks for being here.